Welcome everybody. Um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce to you Simon Woodruff, which you know probably anyway, but I'm introducing him. <laughs> um, so he's the founder of Yo, left school at 16. Um, he was a roadie, stage designer, TV presenter and film distributor before launching Yo Sushi. He has won many accolades, including Restaurateur of the Year and Entrepreneur of the Year, and was awarded an OBE for services to hospitality in 2007. Simon played a one-man show at Edinburgh Festival, has appeared in numerous television programs, including Question Time, and was an original dragon on BBC's Two Dragons Den. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's starting well. Um, yeah, so uh, my first, first question to you um, would be um, the following. Since the majority of our audience is made up of students, and you yourself never studied at university, but rather become an entrepreneur after working as a stage designer and um, yeah, TV presenter. Do you think studying is actually helpful to set up an own business? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, what I wish for you, what I wish for you all, is that you come from slightly dysfunctional families. <laughs> that you're slightly angry with the world. <laughs> that you're not completely happy. And that you're <coughs> fearful of the future. Because otherwise, if you were happy and you had a nice girlfriend and a nice prospect for a job and everything was fine, why would you want to go out and suffer what it takes to start something new and go through all of that and all the fear that's involved. Why would you want to do it? And the thing that I suppose I ask you this question is, you know, what is that thing that's not right in you? And what is that thing? Because I think that most people who go out and do difficult things in the world, whether it's winning wars or becoming a great painter, have something that goes right back to when they were little that sort of drives them. And just to think to yourself, what is that inside yourself? You know, and I know for me, you know, when I was a <clears throat> kid growing up, you know, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't bad, it was pretty, pretty nice in many ways, but it was, we were all the, always the poor relation in the family. It always seemed the rest of our families were kind of was doing a bit better and a bit better off, and you know we were a bit of a cover up. You know. And um, and I remember when I was sort of sixteen, I was also very proud of it, really. But I remember telling people that I was going to be a millionaire by the time I was twenty. <laughs> and then I got to the age twenty, and it was sort of end of the sixties. You know, we were doing all the things we did in those days. You know. <laughs> <laughs> And I remember thinking, I'm going to put off being a millionaire till I'm 30. <laughs> and then I went through the drama. You, wait till you get to your 30s. I went through, you know, the 30s are the hardest decade of the lot. I tell you, if you think this is hard, wait till you get into your 30s. Because the 30s are when you have, you know, you're getting a mortgage and you've probably got a girlfriend, you're getting married, you're just starting something out, and, you know, it's, you're too busy on the phone, you haven't got time to do anything, and you go through the whole drama of your 30s, which is what I did. And I remember getting to the age of 40, I was a late starter in many ways, you know, I remember getting to the age of 40 and thinking to myself, you know, and I, I actually the thought was, I remember having this sort of tear your hair out moment of thinking to myself, I have completely forgotten to become a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the earlier that call to action happens, you know, I'm going to run out of time, you know, when you're actually out in the deep end, you know. Can I just wrap it on for a second? Because another yeah, yeah, thing sure. comes into yeah. my mind is that I remember, you know, I was much later on, but I also wish for you that you're uncomfortable in life. <laughs> you know, but it doesn't feel that good all the time. Because as human beings, we're sort of trained that we want to feel okay. And I remember that age when I started out, <clears throat> you know, when I had small businesses, but when I started, certainly when I started doing sushi, People said, you're okay, you know, you've done this and that and the other, but actually it felt uncomfortable. You know, and I thought I could do more, and I, you know, actually I was finding it hard to survive even. My daughter always says, you were lucky, Dad, you had the gift 
of desperation. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I remember having this image in my mind, it's an interesting image, it's like you stand on a beach and you take a stick and you draw a circle around yourself in the sand and you're inside this sort of metaphorical comfort zone. And I know that when you step outside that comfort zone, you know, what, what do you feel? You feel, well, it's fear. You know, one of the fundamental feelings that human beings experience for quite large periods of time, even if it's kind of hidden away down here, fear. It's a fearful world. You step outside the comfort zone, you feel more fear. That's what people who are successful do. They don't walk around being successful all day. They feel fear, same as everybody does still today. You know. But I know that if you stay out there for a reasonable period of time, but what actually happens is that the fear subsides. <laughs> Anybody read the book, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway? <laughs> Crap book. <laughs> Very good title, I just saved you $9.99. <laughs> and what happens is that like the pebble dropped into the lake, the ripples go out and your comfort zone expands. So when you're feeling comfortable, you're in the right place. And so all you need to find out is where you're going. And Goethe, finish here before we get to another of your questions, but Goethe, who is that German philosopher, you know, nearly, always amazes me, nearly 200 years ago now, you know, an old sort of German, you're from Germany, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you remember, Goethe was a big deal in, in, in he Germany. He is a big he, deal, yeah. He had a big beard, a big coat, you know, very serious. <laughs> like Goethe, every German. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> here, I guess, all this time. Yeah. But Goethe said, tell me if I'm right, but Goethe said, when, you know, the hard bit for me has always been knowing where I'm going. When I know where I'm going, I'm trying to get there. But, you know, with my mind, it chops and changes on here and there. Yeah. But when I know where I'm going, Goethe said, when you know where you're going, when you're truly committed, he said, the world conspires to help and support you in all sorts of ways that you could never have believed possible, including the provision of financial assistance. You know. I love that last bit. <laughs> <laughs> so you said when you started out, um, you, you really were motivated by becoming an, a, a millionaire. So what's your motivation now? I mean, you started many brands after your sushi. I, I, I think, you know, there is no <coughs> exact thing to your motivation. Yeah. Actually, I think my motivation was to prove to other people that I was somebody. And now you because are I saying. actually thought I wasn't. <laughs> yeah. And now I do, you're right, yeah. I do now today believe I'm somebody and I'm very proud of what I've done. Um, and I wouldn't take the risks that I took before. I mm. put, you know, I've, in my time I've put everything on the line, like yeah. everything I've had on the line. And why have I done that? Um, I think partly because you kind of have to do that if you're really going to do something that's a big deal. Mm. But I think more that I never got up in the morning out of the desire for great wealth, but I got out up in the morning from the fear of failure many, many times. So, you know, putting yourself on the line, I think, is certainly something I've done. What was the question? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah what drives you now? Yeah, have I answered it? <laughs> yeah. Is that okay? So, um, yeah, the Dean of the Business School has already kind of um, started on this topic. Of, um, entrepreneurship seems to become quite a trend and cool. Um, so what is, your, what is your view on this development? Is it good or um, is it kind of too much of entrepreneurship currently and everyone tries to get into it? What is your take on this? The truth is, I'll tell you the secret, yeah. for the Dean and I. <laughs> we can't believe our luck. You know, we're of the same sort of era. We can't believe our luck that we were born at this age. Because when we were young, entrepreneur and businessman was a very uncool word. It was very uncool to be a businessman. They all wore white shirts with cufflinks, sat in boardrooms and sort of talked rather like that. Which was, uh, no reason why didn't go and sort that one out, don't you? You know, have long lunches, you know. So today, when I was I started out, you know, I was always an entrepreneur actually, I've, I've done lots of different things, but it's small time really. And 1997 is when we started Yo Sushi. And it was just around that time 
I suppose I was in the van, you know, the forefront of that period when entrepreneur, you know, it started really, you know, with Richard Branson, you know, he had long hair and he was an entrepreneur, a bit like a pop star, and suddenly it started to be cool and you found that you could do it. You know, certainly in Germany when your father was growing up. In Germany, I mean even to today, you can't be nobody had a position of power. Um, in the 70s, 80s, even into the 90s, nobody had a position of power who was less than 50 or 40, yeah, you yeah. know. And when I was growing up, nobody had a position of power when we were young until the Beatles came along. And suddenly, and what was amazing about the Beatles when it arrived is they were 20. And suddenly they're on the front page of newspapers and only people of 40 or 50 yeah. plus had been on newspapers before. So suddenly this whole new world opened and I was an entrepreneur and people were interested in hearing what we were saying. And instead of hiding behind the corporate image, we were going out and talking about things like this. And suddenly we became popular and kids were growing up in school and they're going, what do you want to be? You know, do you want to be a pop star or a film star or a sports person or an entrepreneur? And I was going, cool, man. <laughs> <laughs> So do you think it's a, it's a good development that... that yeah, I think it's fantastic, you know, because actually as we go on in the world, you know, going out into the corporate world, which many of you probably will end up in and some, some of you won't, but I would say that it's just as big a risk today mm. to go out into the corporate world and climb that ladder and fail and play the political game as it is to go off and start something of your own. I went, funny enough, I went to last week, it was pretty cool coming here to see you guys, I'm such a big admirer of this generation, and it's the most amazing generation there's been, really, um, with the potential, and I went to a Google campus, anybody been up to Google campus soon? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's an amazing place, you know, they call, they call Old Street Roundabout now, uh, Silicon Roundabout, mm -hmm. but that's seven floors with a thousand people of your age in there, and they're all starting businesses, and, you know, and working with each other, you know, fantastic kind of thing and that, if that happens you know I always thought that you know certainly Britain here in this country we're in today you know it always held the sort of purse of creativity you go right back to the exploration of the world we weren't terribly nice to everybody we did go out and explore the world and do things and then you come right back into the 60s and the Beatles and Mary Quant and the you know all the things that have happened out of this country and we, we have a sort of got a creative maverick sort of gene here that's that's done through schools like this as well. I hope it keeps it going. That says yes, you can do it, and you can do it. So um, yes, I think it's a fantastic thing. Um, another development is really, I think, this uh, focus on internet in the last recent years. Um, and you yourself didn't start in the internet space. So what? Yeah. What do you think? Uh, is there still more potential outside the internet, or is it actually good that so many people focus on it? Well, I think I, you know, I, I've always sort of rather said. Um, you know, whatever anybody's doing out there, go and do the opposite. I mean, there's no rules in this world for business, but you can, if you go and do the opposite, at least you open up an area that other people aren't mm -hmm. doing. So I've been very good in the material world in yeah. terms of building things. And certainly at Google Campus, everybody was, everybody was doing it. But I think that in the, just picture this, you know, go forward 100 years and let's look back with the benefit of imagined hindsight. I think that when people say we're doing an internet business, actually it's not an internet business. When the telephone was first invented, people didn't say, oh, we're doing a telephone business. <laughs> they just happened to use the telephone. And actually all these businesses are real businesses in different ways. You know, they just happen to use the internet. So that's the way to look at it, is you can go and do anything. And actually I think the high street will be a fantastic place to be. You know, it's going to be completely reinvented. Rents are going to um, come down eventually in some places, especially if you can go off with do something interesting enough off pitch. I was with Sony Music last week. And, you know, we were doing a sort of seminar about you know what they were going to do because, of course, you know all the record companies. You know, I mean, they didn't see it coming, did they? How could they not see that? <laughs> How could they not see it? They're still trying to sell CDs and DVDs. You know? How could they? We all knew that was going to happen. We were thinking, how is it going to be prevented? And I said, go back on the high street, go and do the, go and do the Sony Music Store that Apple did. You know, the Apple Store mm -hmm. is a real store. Yeah. And they said, well, what would it be? And actually, I said, I'll tell you, I, said, I made a record with the Blockheads a few years ago, and I had the most fun I've ever had in my life, ever, 
writing lyrics and working with a guy. I did, I did a song called How I Got My Yo, which is what I did. It. <laughs> I never got to O oh until I found my yo, you know, all that. But it was the most fun. I said to Sony, what everybody wants to do, everybody composes music at home, everybody wants to go into the studio and release albums and become a star. So why don't you do the Sony Music Store on the high street where you go in and there's one recording um, booth and lots of, lots of studios around it and you get to make a record, walk in off the street, we call it Yo, You're Famous. <laughs> <laughs> so is that happening, actually? It's an idea. I've always talked about ideas. People say, don't talk about your ideas, somebody might nick them. My experience in the world is that people who do things constantly talk about ideas. And when mm. I have a new idea about something, I talk about it straight away. And if I, I'm, I'm all, I've been known, somebody comes up, I think, oh, that's a good idea. And I pick up the phone and call somebody and say, what do you think of this, let's do this. And so often, you know, the best ideas. Look, I'll tell you. Yep. This is Felix Dennis. The business is quite easy, really, and it's not just about ideas. And this is, he was the publisher, he published Maxim magazine and GQ, and they eventually gave, gave it up and started writing. And he said, he said, ideas, we've had them since Eve first met Adam. But take it from me, execution's the key. Good fortune, the truth is, the harder you work, the more that you sweat, the luckier you get. The money, go find a likely investor to get what you need, you toadies to greed. The talent, go find it, but first wine and dine it. It's tedious work with a talented jerk. To win it, you've got to be in it, but never be late to quit and cut bait. Expansion is vanity. Profit is sanity. Overhead begs and it walks on two legs. The first step, just do it and bluff your way through it. Remember to duck. God speed and good luck. <laughs> so there's also a poet in you. Um, so you talked about getting ideas. How do you do it, actually? Um, do, you, do you have all sorts of ideas swirling around your head every day, or is it you, you see a problem and then you think there must be a solution? No, most ideas, most ideas don't sound very good at the beginning. And that's where they usually get stuck and stopped. You know, that's why big companies don't do so many new things like that. Mm. Big companies have committees. You search, you search all the parks of all the world and you won't find a statue to a committee. Mm. So, you know, I have a rule which I call, um, well, I call it the three minute, the three second rule. When you're starting something off, be ready, first of all, have a notebook for ideas and constantly write them down and don't dismiss them. Tell people, but don't listen too closely to what other people say. Um, and ban your brain, ban your brain from thinking about whether it's going to happen or whether it's not going to happen, whether it's a good idea or whether it's a bad idea. And you're not allowed to think about it for more than three seconds. If you find yourself thinking about it, you stop thinking about it. Your job is to go out and do the research and try to make things happen. And actually, that's what I did when I did. Because if, I, if I'd sort of said to you, all you guys, if I'd gone and done market research and said, would you like to, <coughs> would you like to eat raw fish or conveyor belts with robots serving the drinks? <laughs> <laughs> or would you like to um, sleep in a seven square meter room with no natural light? Go tell. You're not going to say yes, that's market research. But when both of those things, when people first walked into our hotel, they said the magic words. You know what the magic words are? The magic words is what I'm always looking for. Is that is so obvious. Why didn't somebody do that before? And generally, when you start a new and really, especially a bold idea, I've always wanted to do really bold and radical ideas because in my book, it's only when people, um, some, an idea has to, be, it has to be so sort of bold and radical, or at least the execution of it does, that people go, whoa, God, have you seen what they're doing? In fact, I don't want to do anything that's not world famous. I want, you have got to see this. Yeah, I was actually in the Yotel and experienced the same effect. Um, nice she was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, the robot getting the luggage out. Yeah, you look at that, you know. <laughs> we spent, we spent, oh God knows how much we spent on that robot. Yeah, <laughs> me though, it's we, really we, viable. When you go into the front door of, of the, I'll tell you, actually, I'll tell you the full story. When yeah. you get the front door of the hotel in New York, you know, left luggage, which I was trying to look at every single part of a hotel experience and how you could do differently. So left luggage, you go and find a porter and you leave your luggage and you pick it up later in the day because you checked out earlier or something like that. I said, what about having a wall as big as this with boxes, two to each of those squares, and one of those robotic arms like they use for making cars goes, goes to, comes down, picks up your luggage and puts it into the box up there, you know, stores your luggage. Kind of expensive way of storing your luggage. <laughs> People love it though. They say, you have got to go and see that Yotel. You know, it gets them in there. Whatever you do in this world has got to be great. The same with Yosushi. We had, you know, conveyor belts going around in the first year. So I thought at least people are going to walk in and say, oh, excuse me, there's conveyor belts in that restaurant. You know? <laughs> and then we had, I put call buttons in, you know, pr press, press the button to get you um, to attract attention of a waiter. Oh, excuse me, oh, excuse me, waiter. Press the button. And they had digital voices, you know, they said something different every time you press the button. Hey, I want, yo, I want my sake now. People were impressed with them, they didn't even like sushi. You know. <laughs> so what you do is got to be great. Then that first, those first few restaurants, that first restaurant, I thought, what about serving drinks? Why don't I have robotic, robotic drinks trolleys? Can you imagine, isn't that a great word? Robotic drinks trolleys. People are going to come and see that, aren't they? You know, I don't know if you've ever been out to try and buy a robotic drinks trolley, but they don't. This was in 1996, you know, they didn't exactly sell them on every street corner. And I did my research. In fact, I thought, I'll be honest with you, I thought I, the quote was so high to get one made, I thought I'll get university engineering students to do it, cheap labour. <laughs> and I called around and somebody gave me a number in Edinburgh. I remember phoning the Edinburgh number and this was, you know, 20 years ago and the phone goes ring, ring and this Edinburgh voice, a Scottish voice officer, she says, she says oh, this is Edinburgh, oh, Edinburgh University, this is the robots department, how can I help you? That's great group. And I, I took that technology and married with a company called Brilliant Stages. I like using non-conventional suppliers who do the big rock stages, you know, use some very fast track developments and things that have to be delivered on time about four weeks before we opened that first restaurant in Soho in Poland Street on a building site. Brilliant Stages turned up with a prototype, a stainless steel prototype of this robotic drinks trolley, you know, cool top and everything. And uh, we watched this robotic drinks trolley drive across the front of the building site restaurant right very, very smoothly across the restaurant like this and turn as if, as if of its own volition and drive down the aisle. And I'll tell you what, my fear level went down. You know, I thought people are going to, food's still got to be great, great, great to get people going back. But as this thing turned and went down the aisle, it spoke because part of my specification that each of these trolleys would speak and each would speak in character and as this work drove around the corner and said move your fat ass." <laughs> <laughs> I said somebody's got a fucking job to do in this restaurant I really said that I remember opening and hearing you know this I remember hearing an American tourist he said he, and he turned to his wife he said John, John did you hear what you just said to me? <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I realised that he went, oh, it's a robot. <laughs> you know, I realized that you can do, if you can change, which is what's an amazing thing to be living today and to be doing what you're doing today, is that we've got a world that's a changing landscape. If you can change the landscape of the world you're working in, if you can change the kind of rules of it like that, then you can do anything. Just change the landscape instead of trying to fit the mold. Or I've never been a believer in finding a gap in the market. I've been a believer in making a new market. You know, you can't market research a market that doesn't exist. Do a new one. <laughs> so, um, I mean, yeah, you talk now about Yotel. You started with Yo Sushi. Um, how much easier does it get for you to set up another business? And you now started Look, Yo Home. So. It's much easier. <laughs> yeah, the first one is the hardest. Of course yeah. it is. The first things are the hardest, and then you get more experience, and you get more money and you know I remember you know I, I started to do sushi um, I had a guy called Robin Rowland who runs the business today he came in after four years he was very experienced in the restaurant business mm -hmm. I realized I had the great realization that I wasn't good at running restaurants I was good at starting things mm -hmm. and making them happen you know um, you know we opened that first restaurant with all those things with the robots and this and you know it was the, you know, we, we had a hit, it's like having a hit record, you know, the money was rolling in. And I was running the business, so the money was rolling right back out again. 
<laughs> Robin knew how to run that business. You know, find good people and give them responsibility and allow them to build it up. And in fact, we took that business through and sold it to a venture capitalist. But on the way to get to that venture capitalist seven years in, first sale when I reduced my shareholding from 100% to 25%, mm -hmm. along the way I had to roll the dice several times. You know, I was pretty close to the edge, same as Branson, same as a lot of people. I probably had to roll a two or more to survive at least two or three times. I probably had to row, row a four, you know, that's how much luck was involved. Four, at least once, you know, four and above, you stay in business, the rest you're gone. We managed to survive and we, we sold to the first venture capitalist, which gave us the funding to really build that business. And I, I remember realizing when we sold that business that I hadn't really believed you know, when we opened Yosushi, I could visualize a queue down the block. I really could imagine it. And for something to work, you've got to be able to imagine it. For 75% of the time, the other 25 percent of the time, you can spend your time being scared, you know, 5% terror. You know, but you've got to imagine it. And Robin was able to imagine us selling to that VC. And because it was my money, I hadn't really believed it was going to happen. You know, beyond belief that, you know, you get millions for that and you pay big tax on it. And, um, and we had survived, and I remember going to the lawyer's office, you know, and suddenly these lawyers who'd been absolutely horrible turned into nice people, <laughs> and um, we all had a glass of champagne. And I hadn't, because I hadn't really believed it was going to happen, I suddenly realized on the, the day before, I hadn't arranged for anywhere to put the money. And what they do when you sign the documents, I signed 43 documents, the money gets wired straight into your bank account. <laughs> so they, it was in the data checkbooks, and they said, where do you want the money? And I pulled my checkbook out, and I gave them the sort code and my current account number, you know. And, um, and the guy said, it'll be in your bank. And I remember going back and walking down Oxford Street where I lived in those days, and I'd had a few drinks, you know, and I was looking, I was thinking, whoa, God, here's a new landscape, you know. Yeah. And um, I remember walking past the ATM machine and thinking to myself, you know, if it's... Uh, <laughs> I stood in the queue and I walked up and I put my PIN number in. And there, beyond, yeah, you know, yeah. beyond all belief, was a number that was in my account and it was millions. Yeah. And um, I stood there, I was standing looking at this guy behind me, huge for me, was sort of standing there coughing and spluttering. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you the story, you know, first of all, looking at that number on the stage, if anybody ever tells you that money doesn't make you happy, they're lying. <laughs> <laughs> but I did turn to the guy behind me, you know, I said, I said, you know, I was been there for so long, I said, excuse me, mate, I said, copper, look at this. <laughs> So, um, before I hand over to the audience um, and their questions, um, can you give one final advice to everyone here in the audience? Yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> or two. I, I never, well, you know, it's what comes up on the day, isn't it? Yeah. But I'll tell, I'll tell you something, though. I never, I never, um, I never met the person who went out, who had the courage to go out and do what they dreamed of doing and regretted it, regardless of whether they later succeeded or failed, and lots do fail. But I bet many people later and older in life who look back and said, I wish I'd had the courage to take that opportunity when it put its head up there. That's a great advice. So, um, yeah, I now give over to the audience. And we've got two microphones. Um, one is here, one is here. And Simon will pick, um, pick who will have the questions. So, anyone? Hi. Okay. Um, so this is a question about uh, your sushi. Mm. Um, from what I understand, you refused initial uh, investment um, in your company. Um, why was that? Well, I never refused it, but um, I had um, I had a bunch of <coughs> private investors who were hanging around in the aisles as we got closer and closer to opening. Because you have to be outside your open company so to do something. Actually, I'm really sorry to tell you this. But you don't all get all, all the money together. 
and then when it's all together, you yeah. buy the BMW and you start working. It's really messy. Yeah. It's really messy. It's you're not quite sure, and they were over there, and I had this money here, and, and I was putting it together, and I didn't exactly tell the landlord that all the money wasn't quite in place, and we managed to get to opening, and these guys still haven't come in, and I thought to myself, um, you know, I thought we had a queue, you know, the money was there, and these guys came up, and actually, I kind of pushed them away. I thought there must be another way, and in fact. It's an old story, you probably know, but I, I, um, I actually got the money from the building company. The building company said that they would, um, they would, they basically, I, I actually said to them, would you lend me the money to pay your bill? But that's what a few people, and they laughed, but they did say, the guy called me back a couple of weeks later, he said, we had a board meeting and, um, and, and we're going to do that. And that's how I financed the business on, on loans from the suppliers, because they thought it was, it was doing well. And I asked the guy, and that's how I financed it, and that's why I didn't take the money, and I ended up owning, well, 85% of the company, actually, at the beginning. A childhood friend, a bloke I met in the street in Paris, you know, friends, family, and fools financed the first bit. But I did ask this guy from the building company a few years later, I said, why did your company do that? He said, well, we had a board meeting, and our chairman, who was a wise old dog, hard as nails in the building business, stood up at the end, and I sort of said, you know, that he wants us to, you know, extend their credit. And he stood up and said, I think we should do it. I went to that EOC the other day. I think it's absolutely great. I think it's going to expand. And I think we're going to get a lot of work out of it. I think we should absolutely do that. And he said, I'll tell you why. He said, the business <coughs> on the front door of that first restaurant, we had Sony, Honda, and all Nippon Airline. Have you ever seen three big company names in the front of a restaurant? Sony gave me some cheap TVs. Honda lent me a bike. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I got an upgrade from all Nippon Airlines. <laughs> People were going around saying, this is amazing. And this chairman of the company said, you see that company, they're safe as houses. You know who's backing them, don't you? <laughs> so you can't always get what you want, but sometimes you get what you need. You know, those guys haven't given me anything in particular, but it looked amazing. I've never done it that way. People were going, oh, wow, this is a big deal. You know, Sony have come over to do this big business. You know, all else. You know, there's a myth. You've got to build all of the Googles and all of those. They build a myth around them. You know, you've got to stand up, put your head above the parapet. What am I doing standing here? You know, you know, you can build a myth and then people, you know, we buy things from people. Why do you buy? Obvious one, but why do you buy? Why have you all got iPhones? I've got to tell you, they're not much better than all the rest. There's other ones that are better. It's because you like them and you believe in them, and there's a culture that goes with it. And Steve Jobs was our hero, you know. And it's the same with everything, you know. If you can build that, but that that isn't about being reasonable. You know, none of those guys were reasonable, and they've all got a story to tell. Yes, somebody else. Uh, you first, and then the lady here second. <coughs> Bring the microphone down for her as well, and then we can keep going. Right, far away. Hi, so um, businesses, like these days with entrepreneurship, they mentioned that you should, if you have an idea, that you should validate and test it. And at the same time, you mentioned that, you know, if you go up to someone and say that, do you want sushi in a conveyor belt, yeah. they're, they're not gonna say yes. And so you have to make this assumption that there's some idea that you have that um, might work out really well. How, how did you, um, what was it that uh, helped you verify that you're onto something and how did you go about it? That's a really good question. Because you know, you listen to somebody like me, mostly people who've done things and they just say the complete opposites. In one sentence they say one thing and the other. And that's because, you know, business and life and everything isn't process-driven and linear. It's very, very complex, the world, and how we see it, and how your customer sees it as well. And, you know, your customer would have said, no, we're not interested in that, until they see it. It's like, I've been telling people in um, our Yo homes, which are these very radical homes where you walk into an empty room and so lots of the bedroom comes out, so the whole room becomes a bedroom, the whole room becomes a sitting room, the whole room, okay, you can go check it out, it's, you've got to see it. And you know, people say, well, what happens if this and what happens if that? I said, look, when people buy a house or rent an apartment, you've got an idea in your head about what you want to buy or rent or how many rooms you want and all of that. But when you actually walk in and you see one, that goes out the window. Most people, when they buy homes, they go, oh, I love it. 
I want it. It's an emotional response. And we're very complex as human beings. So the message I'm trying to give you is that things aren't linear and process-driven, actually, in the world. So what, you, what one's job is, is to go out and do the research. Try and empty your mind of preconceptions. Do the research. And when you finish doing the research and you're knowledgeable about that particular area, then leave a fire gap. Don't make the decision based on, a, on two columns which say plus and minuses. Don't make decisions like that. Educate yourself. Get to know as much as you possibly can. Ask everybody's advice, especially people who've been around enough. But don't ever say, should I do it or shouldn't I do it? Do you think it's right or wrong? Just educate yourself. Some goes into the waste paper basket, some routine, some's good information, some they don't know anything. <coughs> but then leave a gap. And then when you're educated, use your gut instinct. Incredible thing, you know, gut instinct when it's educated, but not process. That's what big corporates do. And they can't find it very, very hard to do new things. Yeah. Okay, the lady over here. Um, I want to ask about if loads of people, not really loads of people, but if some people tell you that it's a very good idea, but it's very complex, it's very hard, it's too difficult, and you don't have the right skills, um, what would you advise in that situation? Well, I, I think there's two things. There's two, two things. There's one is, it, anything, anything, even where am I going to go for dinner tonight? There is always a solution. There is always a solution to everything. Um, and I can't remember what the other thing was. There is always a solution. So, so again, your question. Um, you, you, so have you got a particular situation that's going on at the moment? Yeah, like a problem. Yeah. And you um, present this solution. And, and, and they're saying, they're it's, saying a, it's a very good idea, but it's too, comp like, it's too difficult to execute. So you've got to find a way through it. And do you listen? How much weight do other people's opinions have on all of that? I mean, I think that's really the question. And I'd say in that situation, don't stop. Just get a larger notebook. <laughs> and just start doing more work. Because eventually you find out, that's what I call a stone wall. Somewhere in your head you come to a brick wall. And the thing is, when you come to a stone wall, you do two things. One is go round stone walls and carry on walking. And the other is build golden bridges. <coughs> and keep going. But don't be stupid. Remember the poem, never be late to quit and cut bait. So it's a subtle thing, and I, I've always had several things on the go. <coughs> you know, one eventually gets ahead, but just keep going on it and follow your instincts and educate yourself more. But don't listen. You know something? I'll tell you. People who advise you often don't know. <laughs> just remember that. Because otherwise, especially professionals, because otherwise they'd be out doing it. That's why I can't sell entrepreneurs very often. Just keep going. Yes. Simon, hi. And you're next over here. Um, follow, following on that advice, I remember I, I gave you a call probably about six years ago. I had my catering business and, and you gave me um, sort of half an hour of your time on a Sunday. And, and one of the great things was that, you know, <coughs> as, as I heard about you before was that you were very quick to the point, you were always eager to sort of think about things bottom up and, and sort of share that thinking. Um, one of the things that I've sort of experienced as I've sort of built second, third businesses is that the people around you become quite important. It's all about relationships. And so I thought it might be interesting for you to talk about the relationships that you have and how you've evolved to learn what kind of people, what kind of relationships to give them a bit more weight than others. Yeah, well, thank you. I do. I, 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 I'm sure you remind me, but I, I made a decision years ago that because um, I used to call people and they didn't call me back and it drove me crazy. And I realized that if I did call people back, like yourself, that you've probably told 10 people what a great person I am and the thing that the, the thing goes around and suddenly the, the reputation grows and, you know, the business grows like that. Um, 
But uh, yeah, it is, you know, if, if it wasn't, you know, the world would be an easy pe place if it wasn't for people. Uh, people are the issue. <laughs> um, what can I say about people? I just think that as you, as you, uh, my, I had a, I had, I've had a couple of nicknames in my life. One, when there was, when I was at school, there was a, a comic book called The Beano, and there was a character in The Beano called Lord Snooty. God knows what I must have been like. But my dad kind of taught me that if you dig yourself up enough, you know, everybody would be a friend. Of course, it's not true at all. People really put you off, you know. So I had to deal with that, first of all. Um, and then I had another nickname, which was the Steamroller, because I could always see the end product, but I'd steamroller over everybody along the way. And I'd say that certainly the steamroller was, has been a pretty useful thing to have. You know, it hasn't always made me feel the best or made me the most popular, but it's been pretty good to be a steamroller sometimes. And as, of course, as I get older, um, I've often asked myself the question, if I, if I could have been a bit less confrontational and difficult when I was younger, would I have still um, done what I did? And I think probably the answer is no. I think I, I think I probably went a bit too far sometimes. And certainly now I'm a much gentler and nicer person. And when there's people who work with me, I let them do things. And when something comes up, I don't get, get into that <coughs> overwhelmed moment. Gerald, who's my partner in Yotel, I always say his favorite expression is, that is ridiculous. You know, but it doesn't come out, it always comes out instantly, you know, and in fact it's a lot better than it used to be. But, um, you know, that sort of righteous indignation about situations can be very, that's why I said I hope that you're slightly dysfunctional and angry, because you want to get it done bad. You know, I remember used to, people used to come into the um, office on a Monday morning and they'd say, how was your weekend? And you know what went on in my mind? Why would you want to know that? You've got an incredibly interesting project here. We're going to do that. Why would you want to talk about the weekend? That's the past, you know. And now I come into the office and I just specifically say to people, how was your weekend? And they really like it, you know, so it can work. <laughs> but, you know, um, find, find good and interesting people and let them do it their way, not your way. But at the beginning, do everything yourself. At the beginning, in the first one, two, three years of starting a business, I learned to draw in CAD. I learned to use Sage Accounting. I could do everything. I had the, the, the belief that I could do everything better than all of you. <laughs> Fortunately, I learned that I was deluded. <laughs> you know, there's different times of your life you do different things. And then try and find, well, this is a bit light, but got some truth to it. You know, when I see the CVs of people and I look at them, I, I have no idea. You know, the red arrows get people to come in and live with them for a week, you know, before they even think about giving them a job. They go through many, many job interviews. So get to know people before you hire them. I used to get the CVs, they were so overwhelming. I used to shut because I like lucky people. You know those people you meet? Some, yeah, whatever they do, they, somehow they get through, they always luck out. I used to shuffle the CDs, put half in the waste paper basket, that's why I'm the lucky one. Can I join the list? Yes, there's a, somebody up there that we say was the next person. Yes, this lady here is next. Microphone for the lady in black, and then there's a gentleman, a young gentleman at the front here. Hi. Um, the down for the lady. Or you can use your big voice. Yeah. Firstly, <laughs> thank you so much for your very engaging talk. I just have a couple of questions. Firstly, you say that you want to transform the landscape, you want to do things differently and go to people's emotional response. How do you know that even if it's successful in the beginning, it's not just a fact? And secondly, if you have an idea in a space in which you don't have, you don't have past experience, how do you establish credibility and prove it? So how do you know if it's a fad, and how do you establish credibility with people? Well, here's a very good example of the fact that most of us, when we have these problems, we already know the answer. If we can dig deep enough into our pocket and look deep enough inside, we know the answers to most of the problems. So what is the answer to how do you know if it's a fad? What is the answer to that? <laughs> you don't know. So what would the answer be to it if you did know the answer to that? I'll help you, but you know, you already know the answer to that, and you all of you know the answer to that. How do you know if it's going to be a fad? One, you don't. Not really. Two, you have an instinct. 
And three, you can be the person who decides whether it becomes a fad or not. Sushi, raw fish, was that going to be a, was that going to be a fad? Did I know? No, I did not. But I knew that I loved sushi. I mean, I would go so far as to say I was addicted to sushi. In fact, I used to say that facetiously that opening sushi bars, I probably shouldn't say this here, but opening sushi bars in the 90s was a bit like being a drug dealer was in the 80s. <laughs> so I figured that if that many people liked, I didn't know how big it could be, but I knew it would have a niche market of people like me. And as it turned out, it had a much bigger market, and I really didn't know that. And your second question was? How do you establish credibility? How do you establish credibility? Okay. So you already know the answer to that. You go out. The answer to how do you establish credibility <coughs> is you go out, and one minute, one second, one hour, one day, one week, one month, one year at a time, you establish credibility. That's how you do it. It's a very strange thing, confidence. It's a bit like when it's winter time. It's very hard to imagine the warm sun beating down on your shirt in a t-shirt. You can't imagine the sun when it's, when it's cold. And it's the same with confidence. And believe it or not, I've had times in my life where I've had low self-esteem and low confidence. And here I am doing this. You know, you can change in your life like that, but you have to practice doing it by stepping outside your comfort zone and building something and building confidence. And when you do have confidence, when you really truly can believe something, which you get through the magic of enthusiasm, there's only two things I have. I have school with, with two O-levels, so you know I don't have a process-driven brain. So in some ways, I'm ignorant, ignorance, and great enthusiasm. And those are the things, you know, certainly great enthusiasm is the one thing I would look for in people. If you have great, if you can get yourself enthusiastic and excited about a project, then you can walk into a room and you can talk like this but from the heart because you are passionate and excited and enthusiastic about it. It's not, you know, where's your passion? You know, it doesn't come from nowhere, it comes from practicing stuff. You know, if you, nobody's going to get enthusiastic about running unless they go out running, and running is horrible until you get obsessed by it. And then you become passionate about it. So practice. Okay, last question. Um, well, I think I'm not going to give you the last question. I think I'm, I'm going to give okay. you the last question, the lady up here, and then a quick one from you. Yeah. Hi, Simon. Here. Um, hi, Simon. Uh, thank you very much for coming to speak to us. Um, I actually have two questions. My my first question is, uh, given you've run such a successful um, franchise catering business, I wonder what's the most uh, important advice you would give to people who also want to run some kind of franchise catering business? Franchising. Okay, so licensing and franchising, i.e. giving other people your idea. Until you have an idea that's highly developed and highly Put through. If you're going to go into the licensing and franchising business and become the franchisor, you have got you are no in you are a servant. You are a servant to the people you're licensing to. I personally believe that we as leaders are servants to the people who are working for us. You know, because they're the people who are going to make the money. But you're a servant, so you can't just work out the thing and say, I've got this great thing. And I'm going to do it. Uh, the, I'll tell you, he's a really, really good licensor. or love more, hate him, is McDonald's are so good at it because they spend most of their time being servants to their, to their licensees, to their franchisees. And then they spend some of the time, very small amount of time, being policemen. And when I first loved Joe Sushi, we thought we were going to license all over the world and people were calling us up. And of course, what happens is that as soon as you license to somebody, in the three months leading up to opening, they think you're the best thing in the world, they can't get enough of you. Three months after opening, they think, well, what have they got to do with it? They didn't do anything. So you've got to do a lot. Last question. Who was it over here? Oh, it was you. Yeah. Yeah, I was interested Loud voice. Right, yeah, no, you're very successful, obviously. You've got a great story. I'm interested in the mistakes you've made that you can advise us on. 
Okay, all, all, everybody makes mistakes. Fortunately, I've not had one that I've ever ended up owing anybody any money on or bought my company down. Um, one thing that is true, I used to, when I was starting Yo Sushi, I didn't have two fundamental things. I didn't have a site or a track record in the restaurant business. You know, I didn't have a track record, so I couldn't get a big site. And I didn't have the money. I didn't have all the money. So I had to go and do that. I remember focusing down on those two things, the money and the site. And I remember thinking to myself, the one thing that is true of all successful people is successful people don't go around succeeding all day. Successful people are willing to step out of that comfort zone. Successful people, what's common to all successful people? Even when they're successful, they fail. You think of them as walking around being successful. But successful people <coughs> fail constantly. You know, on a minute by minute basis, you know, they fail. And um, in order to succeed, you've got to be willing to be able to be rejected, to be able to fail, to dust yourself off and get up. I had a clothing range for three years that, that failed, that we closed down. I had the Yo Below bars that everybody used to love, which was the ones with had very low table seating. They had singing waitresses. They had, um, had beer on tap, self self beer, self self beer. We closed them down to focus. We had smoke extracting ashtrays in the days when people used to smoke. Smoke extracting ashtrays. And people used to say, lens, lens a cigarette just so we can see the smoke being sucked away. The Times said to me, they said, what are you going to do? Should I end on this? Why not? Got to be politically incorrect. Get some attention. They said, what are you going to do next? I was telling them about smoking, suffering, extracting ashtrays in my yo below bars. They said, what are you going to do next? And I said, well, actually, when they legalize marijuana, which they were talking about at that time, we're going to suck all the smoke into a special room and charge people to go in there. <laughs> <laughs> Calling yo to blow. <laughs> there you go. Thank you.